turn it on. Test one. There we go. Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I was born and raised. I uh, spent 41 years in North Carolina. In case my sermon will offend you later, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do it right now. I am a Tar Heel through and through, through and through. Uh, so, um, uh, a couple of years ago when North Carolina was facing Kentucky in the Elite Eight and Luke May hit a shot at the end of the game to, to win, um, God reminded me just where I was because I one of my coworkers, who was a diehard UK fan, sitting right beside me, and when Luke May hit that shot, I jumped up out of my chair when I did. I tore the calf muscle on the back of my leg. So uh, God was like, "Hey, Adam, do not rub it in." But, uh, um, Colby came to me a few weeks ago, to let me know that he was going on vacation, and he asked me. He said, "Adam, have you ever preached before?" And I said, "Well, a time or two. And um, and he asked me if I would fill in, and I was kind of floored. I was like. Okay, God, what are we doing here? Um, and it just so happens that I was on the way back from uh, from one of Colby and I's coworkers' wedding. I was in his wedding and uh, heard a message uh, from a, a really cool, awesome pastor that I really like, John MacArthur. And um, he was talking about how uh, James, the book of James, is a direct commentary, if you will, on the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5. So I got to looking at it, and I was, okay, I want to see this. I want to see where this is a commentary. If these parallel one another, I want to see this. And it really, really came together for me. So um, this morning, uh, we're going to talk about uh, rejoicing in the tests and trials that we face with peace. Uh, so if you guys will, please turn, with, turn your Bibles with me to James chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 2 through 7. So James tells us, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If you, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, it's, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not man think that he shall receive anything let not, I'm sorry, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. There's a lot of trials and tests that are throughout the entire Word of God. If you look from Genesis to Revelation, there's nowhere in the Bible that you won't look, no book in the Bible that you won't look and find somebody going through a trial or a test. Adam and Eve, they were tested by temptation. Abraham was tested in his faith and obedience. He faced I mean, a trial that I cannot begin to even fathom. Moses. Moses was tested so many times. Uh, Aaron. Aaron lost two of his sons. That is, that is a trial that uh, any of us who are parents would know that we would never, ever, ever want to face is going through the trial of losing a child. Aaron lost two. The people of Israel, they endured what arguably could be seen as one of the most difficult trials known to man. They spent hundreds of years in bondage to the Egyptians. Joshua, Samuel, Jonathan, Mephibosheth, King Saul, David, Job, Jonah, Daniel. The list goes on and on, and that's just in the Old Testament. And it didn't stop in the New Testament days. We, we tend to think about the apostles. We think about you know Paul and uh, Peter, John. Uh, but there was a lot of other trials like the adulterers. Uh, Philemon had to learn how to forgive. And, and of course, the ultimate trial by our Lord, uh, Jesus Christ facing the cross. Uh, trials and tests are they're a basic tenet, not only of true faith, but of spiritual growth and maturity. 
as a believer in Christ, we see these trials and tests being played out in everyday life and only need to watch the news for about five minutes and you'll encounter probably more trials than you even want to think about. Yeah. Buddy Bachum, awesome pastor, said, um, had, had a wonderful saying that he uses in his sermons. I love it to death. He said, if you can't say amen, you better say out. Um, there's uh, so many things going on today that, uh, that if you just take a look around. Um, the book of James, while in many aspects, it will test the faith of believers. It also provides a roadmap uh, to excel at those tests or to endure them. How to come out on top and how to strengthen your faith and how to, how to uh, strengthen your walk with Christ. How to be a more effective witness for the gospel. It's all right there in the book of James. How can we be an effective witness for the gospel if our faith is not shown through trials to others? Can people see this in our personal lives as believers? Can people see our faith in trials and in tests? That's a question I have to ask myself a lot. I work at the Ark Encounter. I'm a canine handler, um, and uh, I encounter people all day long. Most of the time when they have an encounter with me, it's not a good one um, because something's going on. There's a problem or, uh, you know, I have to tell somebody, hey, please don't jump up and sit up on that log. Um, it's 35 feet above the ground. I don't want you to fall. But, um, but most of the time their encounters with me are not the most pleasant. I have to look and I have to really, really examine myself, not just daily, but multiple times throughout the day and ask myself, okay, how would Jesus Christ, how would, how would he treat this individual person? And that is a trial in itself. Um, you know, where Adam failed in the garden and he felt the temptation, Jesus was victorious over temptation. When Satan looked, took him to the mountain to be tempted, and again in the garden of Gethsemane when he was praying, you know, Satan tried to convince our Lord that the burden was too great. Can't do it. But Jesus held true. And with love, he endured and went to the cross. What kind of temptations have you been dealing with this week alone? And how have you responded, responded to those temptations? Well, today we're going to look at one of the tests, one of those trials or tests, if you will, and that's perseverance and suffering. In verse 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Diverse temptations, I had to look at that one because I was like, okay, diverse. Now, it sounds like diverse. So I looked it up, and um, the Blue Letter Bible and Parallel Plus, they're awesome tools to, to look up uh, meanings of words. And I looked up divers in Greek, it's uh, poikilos, and um, it's meta metaphorically changing color and hence the various or diverse temptations in the Greek uh, purosmos is putting to the test proof trial or in a, in a bad sense temptation um, divers is multifunctional and of course temptations is used in the King James as a reference to a test or a trial so James is telling us as believers that we will have trials that will vary greatly but to count it all joy and to embrace those trials with a spirit of joy as it gives us the opportunity to grow in faith and in spiritual maturity. Charles Spurgeon said that trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and let us see what we are made of. Um, so when James tells us to count it all joy, this is not the normal reaction that we all have to trials. It's not my normal reaction trial, a test, a, a tough time, however you want to label it, however you want to call it. It's not my normal reaction. Um, I mean, if you look at a, at, a, at a trial in your life, maybe a financial one, to say to your spouse, oh, honey, isn't it great the car broke down? And the mortgage is due today. And we get to choose. Or take it a step further. What about the young person that's been born and raised in a Christian home, always encountering those who share their faith. I have four daughters. Uh, two were uh, graduated from college and uh, two are still at home. We homeschool. Um, and they both work at the, my two youngest ones work at the ARC. 
there's going to come a time though when they get about 18, 19, 20 years old, they're going to go off to college. My uh, next the oldest wants to join the military and be a canine handler. Uh, or they're going to get a job in the real world. And then all of a sudden, they're no longer in that safe environment. Now, the secular world is going to be in their face, constantly shooting at them with a barrage of everything not friendly to Christ. Very similar to what we were talking about this morning. Um, you know, Satan is the master deceiver, and he is going to deceive, and he is going to um, tempt. And God is going to use these trials to mold, it, mold us as long as we endure and stay, stay faithful to him. But all too many, I think all too many people, all too many parents know what kind of test that, that brings for a child and the strain it can take on us as parents. Unfortunately, there are probably parents here today who know exactly what this is like. To see a child stray from their faith or stop attending church. Ken Ham, the founder and CEO of Answers in Genesis, is a ministry that I work for. He discusses this on a regular basis and just talks in his books. He has a book called Already Gone, how like 80% of young people are leaving the church. And in large part because they're not being equipped to with the tools of, that they need on how to deal with trials and, and tests and temptations. There was a show that was on the History Channel. It's called The Selection. Uh, there was more than 20 civilians that volunteered to enter uh, the selection process, which is by the, it's, it's the process by which candidates are selected for special forces, um, our country's highest level of special forces, Navy SEAL, um, Green Berets. Keep in mind there's about an 80% dropout rate um, of this program, as very few people can endure the rigors of this type of training. Myself as being a former soldier and a law enforcement officer, uh, this show had a lot of appeal to me. And in the first episode, one of the instructors was asked by one of the candidates who had quit. He was one of the first ones to quit. And he asked him, um, with him and said, what has happened to your arm? His right arm was mangled. Um, and this guy was this guy was a buff dude, you know, he was cut, but his right arm was mangled. I mean, it, it looked, oh, he had been involved in a firefight in Iraq. Um, and uh, he was, he gave a, he gave a commentary on it a little bit later and, you know, told, told the audience what happened. And, um, but at the time he looks at this, this uh, candidate who, who had, who had quit and he told him, that um, in order for it to strengthen the sword, it must be dipped in the fire, hammered, dipped in the fire again, over and over, hammered, dipped in the fire, and hammered, making it sharper and making it stronger. He said, my arm, well, it was a little dip in the fire. And one preacher said, we are always in the forge or on the anvil. By trials, God is shaping us for higher things. Two different things from two different people and two different perspectives, but both teaching the same thing. What the nature of our trials will be will vary greatly, no doubt. During the apostolic period of the church, uh, you know, the time of the apostles, they were persecuted constantly. Persecution like we had never seen before or experienced. They were hated for the gospel, despised, treated as lower class citizens. Jesus, however, told us that when we are persecuted for his sake, when we represent him, we share his gospel. When we share his gospel, we will be blessed. Matthew 5, 11 and 12, he says directly this to us. He said, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. Here we go again. Rejoice, be, be happy, and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You know, when I, when I saw this here, and then I look back, back to verse 2 where it says, Count it all joy, it's kind of a recurring theme there. And it makes sense because the ark of most, there's two different. Um, men named James in the Bible who some believe uh, uh, wrote uh, the book of James. Most, most biblical scholars agree on that it was James, the half-brother of Jesus. It makes sense to me. Jesus was there. 
James was there with Jesus, and um, uh, James learned directly from our Lord, which what, what, what an honor. But our Lord tells us that when we are reviled or persecuted, spoken badly of, um, and we stand for Christ, which is in, in itself, it, itself it's a test, it's a trial, that we should rejoice, be exceedingly glad, pass that test, for great is your reward in heaven. This is not just for our reward, but for our growth. And you know, this is, I'm not talking about the name and claim it type thing. I'm talking about our, our reward in heaven, which is um, that we get to stand side by side with, you know, with the Son in person. Um, just incredible. So I asked myself, okay, so Adam, each time I encounter these people at work and, you know, just before work every day, my wife and I, we go into our little war room, which is our laundry room with a bunch of prayer requests on it. We go in there and we pray together. And um, uh, each morning, I pray the same thing to God, if you would. Okay. But uh, I pray, God, if you would, give me, bring one person to me that I can share the gospel with. Uh, just one. If you want to bring more, they, that's great. But bring me one that I can share the gospel with. And then I get to work, and then here I got this person coming up to me. Or you know, we, we deal with medicals on a regular basis. Um, uh, just last week, we had a woman have a stroke at the ark. Uh, can be very very challenging. And I've found that when we that when I pray and ask for God to bring somebody to me, He does it. He definitely does it. Amen. If uh, now. Now the ball's in my court. Now I have to step up and share the gospel with this person, not caring what they think about me, not caring what they, you know, are going to tell me to, you know, to pound salt or get out of their face. What? Well, hey, I'm going to share it, and I'm, I'm going to do it with joy. I have to. Hugh Latimer, he was a British man known as one of the Oxford Martyrs. My pastor at, at uh, Williamstown Baptist Church, where I go, um, he uh, told us about him uh, a few weeks ago. And this, this one really, man, it really cut me to the bone. He was burned at the stake for preaching the gospel. The night before his sentence was to be carried out, his brother came up to him to stay with him and spend time with him. And he told him, brother, go home. Tonight I'm going to sleep like I have never slept before. Much like Peter did the night before his execution. Then at the moment, just before his execution, being burned alive, he said to one of the two others who were being executed with him, he said, and I'm going to quote him here, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, and I trust shall never be put out. Man, I can think of no greater or no worse of a way to be executed than to be burned alive, burned at the stake. And be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England. And I trust it shall never be put out. Not even the thought of being burned at the stake could rob him of his joy in knowing his Savior is a believer in Christ. And going through a trial of facing a horrific death. Think of it. This man was tempted in the strongest way because he was told before he was executed to reject the gospel, denounce it, Admit that you were wrong in what you were teaching by the Queen of England at the time, who was really pushing the Catholic Church, and you'll live. But he did not. He was living out the very concept of Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. That, that, one, that one really struck me hard. I mean, you know, what, what, what types of trials and tests do I face? One important thing to remember is whether you're being threatened with your life or whether you're being challenged to decide whether you're going to pay, pay the mortgage or pay the car payment or, or fix the car. Or if you're just having a hard time getting up in the morning to go to work. It doesn't matter which... which one of these trials that you face. Ultimately, our Father in Heaven has a reason for putting us through these trials, for allowing us to go through these trials. He's going to mold us and He's going to shape us. And as we approach and are thrusted into these trials, James gives us a list of things that will help um, 
a roadmap, if you will, not only on how to succeed at the trials of life, but also how to receive the blessings that are right there waiting for us. Should we see? You know, First Peter one six tells us wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, year in heaviness through manifold temptations. Again, greatly rejoice. We're going to through manifold temptations. That means through many temptations, many tests, many trials. But James tells us that we need to learn to exercise patience, wisdom, faith, humility, joy. Those five things he, he James goes over and over and over and throughout throughout the entire book, not just in the first chapter, but throughout the entire book. So patience, wisdom, faith, humility, and joy. Now, you might say, Adam expect me in some of the most difficult times of my life to exercise joy and wisdom? I'd say absolutely. Is it difficult? I'd say absolutely. Is it contradictory to what we as human beings naturally feel and exercise during trial and test? Absolutely. Is it impossible? Absolutely not. But we cannot do it on our own. It is impossible for us in our flesh to do these things. But when we, when we look to the Holy Spirit to guide us through, when we look to the Spirit and not to our own flesh, then we, re, we will be able to endure producing the results that God has planned for our trials. So let's look at one of the aspects that James tells us is necessary to endure the trials of life. And this one is one that just kind of makes me cringe sometimes. But in verse 3, he says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. The Greek word, hupomone, which is patience. A bearing up under, hence, patient, endurance, holding out or enduring. So, does this mean that I can go to God and I can pray and I say, okay, God, I need patience right now, and then plop, right now it comes to my life. No. God is going to take every one of the, from the smallest uh, temptation to the greatest trial in my life in all of our lives he's going to take that and he's going to use that to mold us and to develop patience to develop more and more and more and more patience um, you know patience is a word that often does strike a nerve in almost everybody that, that, that we meet the context of it is best translated, like I said, is the Greek uh, as endurance or perseverance. And we have to, as our Lord tells us through James, let patience have a perfect work. That means striving to have endurance, to persevere, to push on. So if we face a difficult time period or trial, and the first thing that we want to do is rush through it, get done, move on, then we can never find the blessing that's in store for us. We're never going to find the purpose, the 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 direction that God wants to take us in so that he can mold us to be more like him. Just the other day, I was talking to my dad and I was telling him, you know what, dad, I just want to be able to go to a restaurant and sit down without a mask and have, have a meal, not look at somebody in the dread if they cough or sneeze and not having somebody look at me in dread if I cough or sneeze. It's funny, kids, you could be in the ark on deck two, which is one of the busiest decks there and somebody can sneeze and the crowds part like the Red Sea and just poof, out of here. You know? um, used to be I'd walk through with my canine and people would part. Now, as they walk through my canine, people go, oh, let me pet the dog. But then somebody sneezes and then, But, um, you know, I really, really, really want this to be over with, God. I mean, come on. Um, but, I look at how many benefit how many benefits have come from this. Now, granted, there are a lot of people that have been affected ne affected negatively by this, by this whole COVID thing. But there's also a lot of benefits that have come to, from it. Um, how many parents get to spend more time with their children right now? How many spouses get to spend more time with each other? How much free time? How much more free time do you have to sit down to get in God's word, to study God's word, to grow closer to Him? The first time I visited this church was in April. I think it was in April when you guys were doing the outdoor services. Yeah. Man, 
my wife and I, we were sitting out there in, my, in, in, the, in the black Dodge truck, sitting up there at the front. And we were think, I was thinking to myself, is this what we come to? Have to sit in our vehicle, sitting outside. But oh my goodness. And then it hit me. And I said, Heavenly Father, thank you so much that this church is willing to stay open, that this church is willing to be bold to endure this test and this trial because it's not just the test and trial of people getting sick. It's the test and trial of the government trying to tell you, uh-uh, you're not going to do it. Uh-uh, keep your doors closed. What a blessing. What a blessing. That was incredible for me and really, really, really taught me, you know, yeah, Dad, I want to go to a restaurant. I want to sit down. I don't want to wear a mask. I don't want... I, where did the term social distancing come from? Um, that, uh, that's one of those catchphrases that I'm sure my grandchildren will be talking about. Papa, what was social distancing? Um, but um, I want it to be over with. I just want to be done with it. But God has told us so many times throughout his word, not in your time, but in mine. When Jesus was in the garden and he was praying, he was saying, Lord, if you would please take this cup, let it pass from me. And then he ended it with, not my will, but your will. When we take that time and we allow God's will to play out in our lives, he will use these trials to mold us, to shape us, to make us into something better than we were before and to make us in, 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 to, to a more effective witness, to a more, um, uh, more spiritually mature Christian. So, you know, Dave Ramsey, he, he used to, I mean, still is, he's one of my heroes. Um, anybody not know who Dave Ramsey is? Incredible guy. Financial Peace University. He teaches God's and grandma's way of, uh, of handling money. And he always says that financial peace is so much better cooked up in a crock pot than it is in a microwave. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. You take a, a pizza frozen pizza and you put it in the microwave and it's done in 30 seconds, 40 seconds, maybe a minute. But if you take it and you put it in the oven, it takes it about maybe 10 or 50 and you gotta wait for the oven to heat up too, right? So, um, which one is better? You take it out of the microwave, it's all chewy. I mean, you can sit there and roll that thing up, you know, like a burrito. But if you have it out of the, out of the oven, it's, the, the crust is really crisp and the cheese gets melted evenly. It takes longer. Right? Most of the time when things take longer, they're better. So patience is, you know, it's enduring to allow the trial to produce patience within you. And all the while taking the time to see each purpose of it. Apply, from, apply it, grow from it. Rejoice in the fact that God is working on you. You ever think about that? If you're going through a trial, if you're going through a tough time, what's happening? God's working on you. If you cruise, we talking about this morning about winning the lottery, you know. Um, uh, Robert had mentioned it. And, uh, you know, if you win the lottery, you win, win, win tens, hundreds of millions of dollars, then you have no need for God. Um, in many cases. So, uh, um, so when you don't have, when you are struggling as to whether or not you're going to pay to fix the car or if pay the mortgage. When you are struggling with, any, I mean, with anything for that matter, God is working on you. He is molding you. He is shaping you. And he, you know, that gives us a reason to count it joy that God is paying attention to us. As one of the officers at the, at the ark used to say when, when, things, when things were going tough for him, he said, yeah, he said, God paying a lot of attention to me right now. Um, so, uh, Take joy in it, but allow it to play out. In verse 5 of James, for James chapter 1, verse 5, he says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. It's kind of important to know the context of this section. Um, James is one of the James and Matthew are the two most Jewish books in the Bible, um, and I didn't we didn't read verse one, but in verse one James says who he's talking to. He's talking to the twelve tribes. So, wisdom. What was wisdom to the Jews? 
at the time. Well, let's go take a look at Proverbs, and which is in the, the entire book of wisdom. It was actions. It was works. It was um, wisdom was known as, as as how to how to do things. So, what James is telling us is to if we if we lack lack wisdom, if we don't know what to do, if we don't know how to do something, if we don't know how to how to encounter or how to. Uh, take on a specific trial that ask of God that give it to all men liberally. He's you know he's going to give give it to us if we ask for him and if we ask in faith. Um, verses six and seven say, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of sea driven from the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he should receive anything from the Lord. So asking without faith is the same as not, not asking at all. We're not going to receive it if we don't have, don't ask him in faith. No doubt many of us would end, end this pandemic yesterday if we could. Uh, rather than that, however, are we looking for the purpose of the trial and actively and faithfully seeking wisdom from God, allowing joy to penetrate us? When we do this, we show the character and spiritual maturity that trials can produce. But when we don't, James tells us in verses 6 and 7 what, 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 you know, what will happen. We're not going to receive anything. And here we are taught that when we ask without faith, we receive nothing. Requests be made in faith with a Christ-like heart. Two examples of this are Paul and our Lord. Paul prayed for the thorn to be removed from his flesh. And our Lord prayed for the bitter cup to be passed. While neither prayer was granted literally, both were answered in a way that was most satisfactory to making the two requests while still being most conducive. God's honor and glory. Jesus asked for it, Lord, if it's your will, take this cup, take it from me, but you're not my will, but it will be done. And in the second, in the verse following that, um, in the verse following that, it says that um, that a uh, and a multitude of angels were sent to give Jesus strength. So God answered his prayer. God said, no, I'm not going to take the cup from you, but what I am going to do is I'm going to send my angels to you to strengthen you. So when I pray to God, okay, God, I'm, I'm in this financial hardship right now, or I've got this situation going on at work. I need you to just remove it. No, I'm going to strengthen you so that you can deal with it better. So we look to and pray in faith. Praying in faith praying with faith and really, really, truly with a heart wanting to know what God's will is for, for, for that particular trial and for that particular test. And what the outcome of it will be is going to be based on what he gives us to, to overcome it. Dr. Edmund Clowney said that trials should not surprise us or cause us to doubt God's faithfulness. Rather, we should actually be glad for them. God sends trials to strengthen our trust in him so that our faith will not fail. Our trials keep us trusting. They will burn away self-confidence and drive us to our Savior. That's, that one was pretty good for me. That, that one really, really struck home for me. Folks, trials are going to come and go. All right, We can face these trials with joy and patience and seeking wisdom and growth. Or we can worry, we can fret, we can live in fear and just lose it. How will you respond to the trials that you're going to face from today forward and probably trials that you, maybe trials that you are already going through now? Will you learn to turn to God with patience and endurance, humility and joy in your heart? Or will you lay in self-pity asking, oh God, what did I do to deserve this? Why me? Why can't you just kill me? God gives us the tools that we need to, su to succeed in the trials of life. To come out on the other side a more mature, humble, and patient servant of our Lord. So in closing, have you faced trials, hardships, or even been persecuted and not turned to God to experience the blessing? Blessings which are for you both yourself and for others. In order to be able to turn to God, you must be a member of his royal family, a child of his, made righteous through the blood of a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. John 3.16 said that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believeth in him 
would not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved the world that he gave. You know, James told us that if we pray for, God's going to give and give to us liberally. Well, he gave the ultimate gift in his son. And then he's very clear. Christ is very clear telling us himself in John chapter 14, verse 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except me. Acts 16, 31, it gets even more clearly. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is the direct word of God telling us how to attain that membership in the royal family of God, which will grant us eternal life. There's only one way. There's only one truth. It makes no difference how good a person you are, how many people you've helped or how incredible and awesome things that you've done. Jesus Christ died on the, on the cross for those sins for, of, of those who will believe in him. And if you're here in Colony, if you're here today and you don't know him and you hear him calling you, hear him speaking to you, don't harden your heart. Cry out, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, undeserving of your grace. I believe that Jesus was your son, came to earth as God and man, went to the cross and bore my sins and rose on the third day, being a regenerated, reborn believer in Christ and repenting and turning for sin is the only way to heaven, the only way to eternal life, and the only way that we're going to overcome any of the shortfalls that we have in our lives. My prayer that is anyone here today who does not know Christ as their Savior will come to a saving faith and knowledge of Him. My grandfather was a Baptist minister in Boomer, West Virginia. And I've only, I only was given the opportunity to hear it twice, once in person and once by cassette tape, but my mom told me, and I'll leave you guys with the same message that my pastor would always, that my grandfather would always close his sermons with. He's made it peace and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father,